I'm sick right now, but I needed to get this video out. Yeah. You've likely heard about scam after scam committed by real estate investing gurus on social media, and you likely click this video because you're nosy and you want to know what they did, but also as someone interested in real estate, you likely want to know how you can avoid becoming a victim yourself. Now, when I started documenting my real estate journey on this channel a few years ago, I was in a dangerous place, which is probably similar to where you might be right now because I was searching for those who knew more than me so that I could start investing. And this is when we are most vulnerable to these so-called scammers. So in this video, I'm going to give you five red flags to watch out for to make sure you don't end up listed as a victim on a federal indictment. Popular online real estate investors like DJ Envy, Grant Cardone, Noel Randall, Jay Morrison have all been accused of scamming their audiences. And I'm not saying they're all guilty and I'm not trying to get sued. I'm just reading the news. Listen. So if you want specifics on any of the accusations against them, I'll put links below. But regardless of how their court cases turn out, victims in those situations may have thought twice about wiring in their life savings if they were able to recognize the five red flags that you're about to learn. First red flag, you don't understand the fundamentals of what you're investing in. Now in this clip, a guest on The Breakfast Club grills Envy about how he makes money from real estate. I don't see houses. But what if you flipping something, ain't it okay. houses? <laughs> You do right. every time I see you doing something, you flipping a house in New Jersey and some shit like that. No, I'm not real too. houses. I, no, but I you buy flipping. houses, I, f I fix them, and I rent them out. But I'm trying to figure out because then you got the home and you try to make money off the home. Are you making money off the home? Yes, ma'am. So you selling the homes? I'm keeping it. She's basically saying that she doesn't understand how he can make money if he's not selling the house. And he's trying to explain that he doesn't flip or sell the house, he rents it out instead. Now I'm not defending Envy, and this is one of the only clips on the internet making him look good right now. I'm gonna be giving one lucky person one of these chains. Now, these chains are serious. Whoever we give this chain to in our camp or our friends, they own properties and they invest. So we're gonna be giving one lucky person one of these chains. So we wanna see you guys. Tickets are just $99 right now. But this is just an example of someone not understanding the different ways that you can make money in real estate. I had a mentor explain it to me like this and it changed my perspective whenever I went into a potential deal just because I knew what the five wealth drivers of real estate are. The first is cash flow. And this is what you get when you own a property and you rent it out. And this is what Envy claims to have been doing with his property. If the mortgage and all the costs associated with running that property are $1,500 per month, but you rent it for $2,000 per month, you make $500 in cash flow. Now, if you over time work hard and you accumulate 10 rental units that are also making $500, that would be $5,000 per month. That's cash flow. Now, appreciation is different. It's the increase in the value of a property and it can happen slowly over time or appreciation can happen quickly. It can be forced through a renovation, which is what house flippers do. Like if we go out and we buy a property for 100K and then we invest $50,000 into the rehab, we've spent $150,000 on that property. If we now sell it for $225,000, we've made $75,000 in profit. Now, of course, you still have to pay some closing costs and taxes on that profit. But this is a general example of how when people flip a house, they're making money on the forced appreciation, making that house worth more. Now, before we go to wealth driver number three, we can take this to another level by combining one and two. And many people People, including myself will start with one and then wait a little while and take advantage of number two so for example I bought this property two summers ago and I renovated both the front house and the mother-in-law suite in the back now I've been renting out that property and collecting a few hundred dollars a month in cash flow after I pay my mortgage and my expenses my plan though is to also take advantage of appreciation and let this property grow in value over time while I'm collecting that cash flow. And then eventually down the road, when I'm ready to cash out on the appreciation that I've built up, I can do so and buy another property. I can pay for a big event or whatever I want. Cash flow now, appreciation later. Now the third wealth driver is called loan pay down. And let's say we owe $100,000 as a mortgage on a rental property. As the property appreciates over time, we gain what's called equity, which is basically how much money we would make if we sold the property and then paid off the mortgage. But what also increases our equity at the same time as appreciation is that we are making mortgage payments each month. So that $100,000 mortgage is slowly decreasing and the equity in the middle is getting bigger and bigger for the day that we eventually decide to cash out, either through a sale or what's called a cash out refinance. If you wanna learn more about cash out refinances, I will put a link to this video in the description. Now stick with me because the fourth and fifth wealth drivers are not talked about as much, but they are very important, if not a little, boring 
to be honest. Um, but they are depreciation and tax benefits. And depreciation is just one of the type of tax benefits that come along with real estate investing. Depreciation is when over time you write off the value of an asset. So just like your phone or your car will lose value over time, so does your rental property. But that's just on paper. Because remember we said in the real world, rental properties are generally going to appreciate and go up in value over time. But on paper, claiming that your property is depreciating and losing value over time means that you save money on taxes. So if as an example, we have a property that is worth 275,000 and we're saying saying that's just the property we're not including the value of the land because you can't count the value of the land towards depreciation so 275,000 that's what the house is worth the IRS says that you can depreciate the value of the property over 27.5 years why 27.5 years I have absolutely no idea but that's the rules so we could claim ten thousand dollars in depreciation per year now let's say that this is a multi-unit property you have five units on the property again don't worry about the price i'm just making it simple so that the math works out but let's say you have five units they rent for five hundred dollars each so you're making twenty five hundred per month or thirty thousand per year if your expenses are 30k per year that means you made ten thousand dollars profit as like actual cash in your pocket then you also need to think about the fact that you can still take $10,000 in depreciation. So that offsets the $10,000 in cash that you made and you don't owe taxes on it, allegedly. That's an oversimplified example, but this is to show you that there are many ways real estate investing can help you, not just with your taxes, but through each of these five wealth drivers. So here's your homework. Go explain those five points to a parent, a friend, a coworker, a kid, I don't care. But if you can't talk about it for 10 minutes and explain it in simple terms, don't put your money into it. I'm not saying that you have to invest in something only when you are the world's greatest expert, but if you can explain it at a basic level, talking about it for 10 minutes or so, then it's probably not the best place for you to be investing. And if you're still struggling, that's okay. That's what this channel is here for. I'll link a few videos as well as a few books that have helped me along the way. All right, the second red flag is that the return is just too good to be true. Now that you know how real estate makes money, you've got to be realistic about how much it can actually make. There are countless scammers out there in the YouTube comments promising to turn $10,000 into $100,000 in just a few hours. And I get messages all the time offering me six figure returns in a matter of days if only I'll send in a few thousand dollars of my own. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Now, DJ Envy's partner is the one who's actually listed on the federal indictment. And some people think that the charges may be coming directly against Envy as well soon. But his partner allegedly stole millions of dollars from investors after promising 30% returns in four months. And there was an example of this broken down in Spencer Cornelia's video, where an investor gave a hard money loan of 150,000 for a 30% return. And this immediately stood out to me as fishy because I've never heard of a hard money loan with that type of return. The property that I referenced earlier in this video was one where I used a hard money loan and I paid 10% for a loan of $90,000. I've heard of loans like this going up to 12%, maybe even 15% if it's a really risky deal, but 30% is insane. And the main reason for that is how the heck is the deal supposed to work if the investor is paying that much interest on the loan? The investor has to take a combination of what they paid for the property, what they have to pay to renovate it, their holding fees, like the taxes and insurance and utilities they pay during the renovation, and their loan fees, the interest that they're paying to borrow the money in the first place. What's left over is the profit. And the bigger the loan fees, the less the profit, the less likely the deal is to succeed, and the less likely the lender is to be paid back anyway. In my opinion, that return was just too good to be true from jump. Plus, if the guy was so legit, why would he want to pay 30% returns to individual investors when he could have just gone to a bank or a typical hard money lender for 10 or 12%? The third red flag is when the person who is richer than you and more knowledgeable than you and is going to do all of the work needs your money in every deal there are three ingredients the money the knowledge and the time and effort it takes to get it done when i've gotten loans from private money lenders they are investors that are richer than me and they're bringing the money but i've got to bring the knowledge to execute that specific deal 
and I've got to spend the time and effort doing it. The entire reason that they've become private lenders at that point in their career is because they have the cash, but no longer want to spend the time it takes to manage renovations. Now, there are definitely legit real estate funds out there. I just find it hard to believe that a guy who's worth $50 million and is gonna do all the work and is gonna find all of the deals still needs a couple hundred grand from a first time investor to make it all happen. Next red flag, there's something fishy about the structure. And in this case, it's people doing things off the record. One of the main charges that Caesar is up against is wire fraud. And from what I could tell, when he was accepting these private loans, they were being wired straight into his bank account. Wrong, wrong, wrong in every way. For every deal that I've ever done, Whenever money needs to change hands, it goes through the title company, or depending what state you're in, it might go through a real estate attorney's office. If someone needs to submit earnest money on a deal, that goes to the title company and they distribute the money as outlined in the contract. When I accepted that $90,000 private money loan, it did not come to me. It went to the title company who then applied it towards my balance when I went to purchase the property. Doing things the right way protects everyone. And if it's an issue or someone is pressuring you to do things around title companies or without contracts just so they can save a couple hundred dollars on fees, they're likely not the person that you want to be giving tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to in the first place. And before you enter any deal, if you haven't thought very, very realistically about the worst case scenario, you're in big trouble. Early on when I started investing, whenever I walked through a property, I imagined all the amazing things that could happen. That this area here could be turned into a breakfast nook or I could get extra rent by adding a storage unit in the back. Uh, the nearby school meant I have lower tenant turnover, etc., etc. But what you should always be doing is actually looking for all the horrible things that could happen. Be like, is that water damage? Could this whole place have mold behind the walls? Or there's no gutters on this house. Has the foundation started to take damage? Or that person said, I'll make 100K on this deal, which is the best case scenario. But what's the backup plan and worst case scenario if things go horribly wrong while we're trying to make it happen? It's not being negative, it's being realistic because things will go wrong. <laughs> you will lose money when you're investing and you should not just consider that before you go into any deal, but you should be okay with it because it is your money that at the end of the day is on the line. And even if you go down the path of suing someone in federal court, there's no guarantee that you'll get it back. So which of these red flags will you be keeping an eye out for? Let me know in the comments.